I'm back, people! Okay, so I'm sorry this video has been so long in coming, but I finally found Magic's Pawn again. It has been... I don't even know how long. So I'm going to keep the old intro I did way a few weeks ago. I'll, the, I'll patch this one in somewhere, probably before the other one. But I'm back. I found Magic's Pawn. Sad enough, um, I found Magic's Pawn, but I lost the first book of the Dark Elf Trilogy, <laughs> so, I mean, give and take? Why can't I keep any of my books in a place where I will remember them? I guess I put them up, but then I forget where I put them, so I'm right back in square one. <laughs> with losing books. But I still have John Carter. I will be working on him in the near future. Um, yeah, so I will be working on more books for you guys. I'll be working on John Carter. I will keep doing Mercedes Lackey Magic Pond. I will do it. I will not lose it again. Okay? I promise. Okay? Enjoy! Hey guys, it's Kat. Um, if you can't tell, I got a different headset. So now I am not as worried about background noise, but I'm still holed up in a quiet corner of my basement because the basement is the only quiet area of my house. Sorry if the audio gets a little loud. I got used to talking relatively loud for my phone microphone to pick it up. So um, this is going to be Mercedes Lackey's Magic's Pawn Chapter 5. I'm recording this on May 16th, so let's see how quickly this gets up, shall we? So let's get right on to the video. I hope you like it. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Okay, bye! Chapter 5. Talendale was sprawled carelessly across the grass in the garden reading. Daniel watched him from behind the safety of his window curtains, half sick with conflicting emotions. The breeze was playing with the trainee's tousled hair, almost the same way it had in his dream. He shivered and closed his eyes. God, oh God, why me? Why now? And why, oh why him? Seville's favorite protege. He clutched the fabric of the curtain as if it were some kind of lifeline and opened his eyes again. Talendale had changed his pose a little, leaning his head on his hand, frowning in concentration. Daniel shivered and bit his lip, feeling his heart pounding so hard he might as well have been running foot races. No girl had ever been able to make his heart race like this. The thought made him flush, his stomach twisting. God, what am I? Like him? I, I must be. Father will- Oh, 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 God. Father will kill me. Lock me up. Tell everyone I've gone mad. Maybe I have gone mad. Talendale smiled suddenly at something he was reading. Daniel's heart nearly stopped, and he wanted to cry. If only he'd smile at me that way. Oh, God, I can't, I can't. I daren't trust him. He'll only turn on me like all the others. Like all the others. He turned away from the window, invoking his shield of indifference with his sick and heavy heart. If only I dared. If only I dared. Seville locked the brass-bound door of her own private version of the workroom, with fingers that trembled a little, and turned to face her favorite protege, Tylendel, with more than a little trepidation. Gods, this is not going to be easy. She braced herself for what was bound to be a dangerous confrontation, both for herself and for Tylendel. She didn't think he was going to go for her throat, but, well, this time she was going to push him just a little farther than she dared before, and there was always the chance that it would be too far this time. He stood in the approximate center of the room, arms folded over in front of his plain brown tunic, expression unwontedly sober. It was fairly evident that he had already gathered this it was not going to be a lesson or an ordinary discussion. There was nothing else in this room, nothing at all. Unlike the public workroom, this one was square, not circular. But the walls here were stone, too, and for some of the same reasons. In addition, there was an inlaid pattern of lighter-colored wood, 
delineating a perfect circle in the center of the hardwood floor. And there was an oddness about the walls, a sense of presence, as if they were alive. Well, in a way, they were. Seville had put no small amount of her own personal energies into the protections of this room. They were, in some senses, a part of her, and because of that, she would be safer here than anywhere else, if something went wrong. You didn't bring me here. Practice, Talendel stated flatly. Seville swallowed and shook her head. No, I didn't. You're right. I wanted to talk with you. I have two subjects, really. And I don't want anyone to have a chance at overhearing us. The first subject? Talenda asked. Or, I think I know. My family again. His expression didn't change visibly, but Seville could see his sudden anger in the stubborn setting of his jaw. Your family again. Seville agreed. Talendo, you're a herald, or nearly. Heralds do not take sides in anyone's fight, not even when their own blood is involved. Your people have been putting pressure on you to do something. Now I know you haven't interfered, but I also know you want to. I'm afraid you might give in to that temptation. His mouth tightened and he looked away from her. So, Evan Lashara can pour his poison into the ear of anyone at court who cares to listen, but I'm not allowed to do or say anything about it, is that it? I'm not even allowed to call him a damned liar for some of the things he said about Staven. He pulled his gaze back to her and glared at her as angrily as if she were the one responsible for his enemy's behavior. It's more than just my blood, Seville, it's my twin. And by all he believes, by all he holds true, we've got blood debt to pay here. And Staven, oh, for all that he's young, his lord holder now. It's his decision. For the rest of us, Frelin must and will support him. And besides that, he's the right. God damn it. Lord Holder or not, young or not, right or not, he's a damned hot headed fool. Seville burst out, flinging up her, both her hands before her in a gesture of complete frustration. Blood debt be hanged. It's that kind of fool thinking that got your people and the Lashara into the stupid feud in the damned first place. You can't bring back the dead with more blood. It's honor, damn it. He clenched his hands into fists. Can't you even try to understand that? It has nothing to do with real honor. She said scornfully. It has everything to do with plain, obstinate pride. Wendell, you cannot be involved. She froze with her heart in her mouth as he made one angry step towards her. He saw her reaction and halted. She plowed onward, trusting in the advice she'd gotten. Please, Jason, be right this time, too. This whole feud is insanity! Lendl, listen to me. It has to be stopped. If it goes on much longer, it's the Heralds who will have to stop it, and you cannot take sides. All right, so far, she hadn't said anything new. Now for the fresh goad and hope it wasn't too much of a go too soon. Lendl, I know you've never been able to figure out why both you and Steven weren't taken by companions. Well, damn it! It's exactly this insanity that's the reason your beloved twin didn't get chosen, and you did. You at least can see the futility of this when you aren't busy defending him. He's too full of vainglory and too damn stubborn to ever see any solution to this, but crushing the Lashara branch and root. Your twin is an idiot, Lendl. Lashara, he's just as much an idiot as Wester Lashara. But that doesn't change the fact that he's going to get people killed out of plain stupidity. And I will not permit this to go on for very much longer. If I have to denounce Staven to end your involvement with this, I will. Never doubt it. You have more important things to do with your life than waste it defending a fool. Talendo's fists clenched again. He was nearly rigid with anger. His eyes went nearly black, and his face completely white with the force of his emotion. And for one moment, Seville wondered if he'd strike at her this time. Or strike at her. That is, if he came for her. She didn't intend to be where his fist landed. Or his leaven bolt, if it came to that. Please, lord and lady, don't let him lose it this time. Let him stay in control. I've never pushed him this far before. And don't let him try magic. 
If he hits out, I may not be able to save him from what my protections will do. She prayed and looked steadfastly, and she hoped compassionately into those angry eyes. She could feel him vibrating inside, caught between his need to strike out at the one who had attacked his very beloved twin and his own conscience and good sense. Seville continued to hold her ground, refusing to back down. Tension in the room was so acute that the power-charged walls picked it up, reverberating with his rage, and that fed back into Seville. Will she? Nil she. It was all she could do to hold fast and maintain at least the appearance of calm. Then he whirled and headed blindly into a corner. He rested his forehead against the cool stone of the wall with one arm draped over his head, pounding the fist of his free hand against the gray stones, cursing softly under his breath. Now Seville let him alone, saying absolutely nothing. Once you get him worked into a rage, let him deal with his anger and his internal turmoil in his own way, had been Jason's advice. Leave him alone until he's calmed himself down. Finally, he turned back to the room and her, bracing himself in the corner, eyes nearly closed, breathing as hard as if he'd been running a mile. You'll never get me to agree to stop supporting Staven, you know. He said in a perfectly conversational tone, I won't interfere with the Herald, I won't help with the feud, and I won't call Evan Lashara a damned liar, but I will defend Staven and what he thinks is right, if only to you. I love him, and I'm not going to give that up. There was no sign that a moment before he'd been in, literally, a killing rage. I know, Seville replied just as calmly, giving no indication that she was still shaking inside. I'm not asking you to give up loving Staven. All I want for you is to think about this mess. Not just react to it, but if that was the only... Your two, but if it was only your two families, it would be bad enough. But you're involving the whole region in your feuding. We know very well that you're both, you're both been looking for mages to escalate this thing, and Lendl, I do not want to hear a single word about which side started that. The important thing is that if either side involves magic in this, the heralds must and will take a hand. We can't afford to have wild magic loose and hurting innocent people. You are a herald. Or nearly. You have to remember that you cannot take a side. You have to be impartial. No matter what Evan Lashara does or says. Tylendale shrugged, but it was not an indifferent shrug. His pain was very real, and only too plain to his mentor. She hurt for him. But this was one of the most important lessons any herald had to learn. That he had to be impartial. No matter what the cost of impartiality was. And no matter whether the cost was to himself or to those he cared for. All right, he said tonelessly. I'll keep out of it. So, now that you've turned my guts inside out, what else did you want to discuss? Vaniel, Seville said, relaxing enough that her voice became a little dulled with weariness. He's been here for more than a month. I want you to tell me what you think. God... He sagged back against the wall and opened his eyes completely. They had returned to their normal warm brown. You would bring up his loveliness. What's the matter? Seville said sharply. Took a closer look at him. He was wearing a most peculiar half-smile. And she smelled a rat. Or at least, a mouse. Lendl, don't tell me you've got involved in love with the boy. He snorted. <laughs> No, but the latter's putting a lot of stress on my self-control. Let me tell you that. When I don't want to smack that superior grin off his face, I want to cuddle and reassure him, and I don't know which is worse. I don't doubt, Seville replied dryly, walking over to where he leaned and draped herself against the wall opposite him. All right, obviously you've had your eye on him. Tell me what you've figured out so far. Even speculation will do. Half the time, I think you ought to drown him. His trainee, her trainee replied, shaking his golden head in disgust. That miniature court he's collecting around himself is sickening. The posing, the preening. 
Seville made a little grimace of distaste. You don't have to tell me. But what about the other half? In my more compassionate moments, I'm more certain than ever, ever he's hurting. And all that posing is just, just that. A pose, a defense. That the little court of his is just to convince himself that he's worth something. But I've made overtures, and he just goes to ice on me. He doesn't hit at me, he just goes unreachable. Well, Seville eyed her protege with speculation. That particular scenario hadn't occurred to me. I thought that now he'd been given his head, he was just showing his true colors. I was about ready to wash my hands of him, foster him with, oh, Odin or somebody. Somebody with more patience, spare time, and court connections than me. Don't. Talendale said shortly, a new and calculating look on his face. I just thought of something. Didn't you tell me one of the things his father was absolutely livid about was his messing about with music? Yes. Seville said, slowly pretending to examine the knuckles of her right hand as if they were in, of intense interest, but in reality concentrating on Talendale's every word. The boy was a marginal empath when he wasn't thinking about it. She didn't want to remind him of that fact, of that gift just now. Not when she needed the information she could get from it. Yes, she repeated. Point of fact, he told me that I was to keep away the boy away from the bards. And you told me Bretta let him down gently, or as gently as she could, about his ambitions. How often has he played since then? Now Seville gave him a measuring look of her own. Not at all, she said slowly. Not a note since then. Margaret says there's dust collecting on that loot of his. Lord and lady! Talando bit his lip and looked away. All his attention turned inward. I didn't know it was that bad. I thought he might at least be playing for the social butterflies he's collected. Not a note. Seville repeated positively. Is that bad? For a lad who's certainly good enough to get a lot of praise from his psychophants? For one whose only ambition lays with music? It's bad. Worse than bad. We broke his dream for him, Seville. I take it back. The first half of what I said. Talendell rubbed his neck, betraying a growing unease. He looked up the ceiling, then back down at her. His eyes now frank and worried. We have a problem. A serious problem. That boy is bleeding inside. If we can't get to him to open up, he may bleed himself to death. How do we get at him? Seville asked, taking him at his word. Her weakness and what made her a bad field herald, although it was occasionally an asset in training protégés, was dealing with people. She didn't read them well, and she didn't really know how to handle them in a crisis situation. This business with Tylendale and his twin and the feud, for instance? I would have never thought of this solution. Desensitizing him, weaning him into thinking about it logically by bringing him to the edge over and over, but never letting him slip past that edge. Bless Jason, and damn him. Gods, every time we play this game, it wreaks as much damage on me as it does on poor Lendl. I'm still vibrating like a harp string. Tylenda pondered her question a long time before answering. His handsome face, utterly quiet. His eyes again turned inward. I just don't know, Seville. Not while he's still rebuffing every overture he gets. We need some time for this to rebuild, I think. And then some event that will break his barricades for a minute. Until that happens, we won't get in. And he'll stay an arrogant bastard until he explodes. She felt herself grow cold inside. Suicidal. To her relief, Tylendell shook his head. I don't think so. He's not the type. It wouldn't occur to him. Now, me? Oh, never mind. No, what he'll do is go out of control in one way or another. He'll either do it fast and have some kind of breakdown, or slowly and botch himself into a state of where he's got about the same amount of mind left as a shrub. Wonderful. She placed her right hand over, over her forehead, rubbing her eyebrows with thumb and forefinger. Just what I wanted to hear. Townsville made one of his expressive shrugs. You asked. 
I did, she said reluctantly. Gods, why me? If it's any comfort, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It better not. I have an emergency council session tonight. She sighed and rubbed her hands together. I'll probably be up half the night, so don't wait up. Does this mean the interview is over? He asked, quirking one corner of his mouth. It does. You can have the suite all to yourself tonight. Just don't leave crumbs on the floor or grease on the cushions. I wouldn't care, but Margaret will take your hide off in one piece. And don't go looking for the lovebirds either. They're out on a fortnight field trial with Shallon and her brood, so you'll be all alone for the evening. Oh, gods. All alone with the beautiful Vanya. You really want to test my self-control, don't you? He laughed, then sobered, shoving away from the wall and, and straightening. On the other hand, this might give me the chance I was talking about. If I get him alone, maybe I can get him to open up a bit. Seville shrugged and pushed away from the wall herself. You're better than I with people, lad. That's why I asked your advice. If you think you have an opportunity, then take it. Meanwhile, I have to go consult with the Queen's own. And from there, straight to the meeting? No time for a break? Talendal asked sympathetically. She nodded. He reached for her shoulders and embraced her closely. See that you eat, teacher. He murmured into her hair. I want to stay around for a while. Not wear yourself into another bout of pneumonia. Maybe you'll kill and maybe kill yourself this time. Even when I hate you, you old bitch. You know I love you. She swallowed down another lump in her throat and returned the embrace with a definite stinging in her eyes. I know, love. Don't think I don't count on it. She swallowed again, closed her eyes, and held him as tightly a brief point of stability. In a world that too often was anything but stable. I love you too, and don't you ever forget it. The emptiness of the suite almost oppressed Talendel. With the lovebirds gone, Seville do, so the dinner time rumor in the kitchens had it, for a till dawn council session in her capacity as speaker for those heralds teaching protégés, and Vaniel presumably entertaining his little courtier for followers, there was nothing and no one to break the stifling silence. It closed around him like a, like a shroud, until the very beating of his heart was audible. Outside the windows, it was as dark as the heart of sin, and so overcast not even a hint of the moon came through. His scalp was damp, hot, and prickly. Sweat trickled down the back of his neck and soaked into his collar. It felt a whole lot later than it actually was. Time was crawling tonight, not flying. Talendel gave up trying to read the treaty on weather magic Seville had assigned him and switched to a history instead. A handwritten pamphlet on weatherworking was not what he needed to be reading right now. Anyway, not with a storm threatening. His energy control wasn't as good as he'd like, and he didn't want to inadvertently augment what was coming in. He was a lot better at controlling his subconscious than he had been, but there was still no point in taking chances with Seville out of reach. The storm was at least part of what was making the sweet seem stuffy. Talendale sensed the thunderstorms building up in the west, even though he couldn't see them from where he was sprawled on the couch of the common room. That was the gift that made him a herald mage trainee, and not just a herald trainee. The ability to see, and otherwise sense, and manipulate energy fields, both natural and supernatural. His gifts had come on him early, and a long time before he was chosen. They had given him trouble for nearly half of his short life, and only his twin support had kept him sane in the interval between their onset and when his companion Gala finally appeared. Are you tucked away safe, dearling? He mind spoke to her. When this blow comes, it's going to be a good one. The drowsy affirmative he got told him that she was half asleep. He did that to her. He mostly made him irritable. He had propped every window and door wide open and to hell with bugs. But there wasn't even a whisp of breeze to move the air around. The candle flames didn't even waver. And the honey beeswax smell of the candles placed all around the common room was almost choking him with its sweetness. He shook back his damp hair, rubbed his eyes, and tried to concentrate on his book. But part of him kept hoping for a flash of lightning in the dark beyond the windows, or the first hint of cooling rain. And part of him kept insisting that all he had to do was nudge it a little. 
he told that part of himself to take a long walk and waited impatiently for the rain to come of itself. Nothing happened. Just an itchy sort of tension building. He gave up trying to concentrate, got up and went to the sideboard for a glass of wine. He needed to get centered and calmed and a little less sensitive, but he wasn't going to be able to do that on his own. The only wine left was a white, and it was a bit dry for his taste, but it did accomplish what he wanted it to do. With just that hint of alcohol inside him, he finally managed to relax and get into that blasted book. He got so far into it, in fact, that when the first simultaneous blast of wind and thunder came, he nearly jumped half off the couch. Half the candles, the ones not sheltered in glass chimney lamps, blew out. Wind whipped through the suite, sending curtains flying and carrying with it a welcome chill and scent of rain. The shutters in Marduk's and Donnie's room banged monotonously against the walls. Not hard enough to shatter the glass yet, but it was only a matter of time. He dropped the book and got up to head for their door, just as Vaniel stumbled in through the corridor door and into the brightness of the common room. The boy stood as a frozen statue, blinking owlishly at the light. Talendale's stomach gave a little lurch. Vaniel looked like death. It was bad enough the boy was light complected. Bad enough that he was wearing stark black tonight, which only accentuated his fair skin. But his face had no color in it at the moment. It was so white it was almost transparent. His eyes looked sunken and his expression was of someone who has seen, but been denied the havens. Vaniel, Talendale said, whispered really, his voice barely audible above the banging shutter and the sound of the storm. He cleared his throat and tried again. Vaniel, I didn't expect you back so, uh, soon. Is anything wrong? For one moment, for one precious moment, Talendale thought he had him. He was sure the boy was going to open up to him. His eyes begged for pity. His expression so hungry and haunted nearly cracked Talendale's own calm. The trainee made a tentative step toward him. It was the wrong move. He knew that immediately. Vandal's face shuddered and assumed his habitual expression of flippant arrogance. <laughs> wrong, he said, with false gaiety. Right, lady, no. Of course there's nothing wrong. Some of the bards just came over from their collegium and started an impromptu contest. It got so damned hot in the great hall, with all those people crowded that I just gave up. Just then, the shutters in both the life bondage room and Seville's crashed against the walls with such force that it was a wonder the windows didn't shatter. Havens! Seville yelped. She'll kill us! And dove for Seville's room. Talendale ta dashed into the other, mentally cursing his own clumsiness, and cursing himself for letting his reaction to the boy cloud his reading of him. By the time he got everything secured and returned to the common room, Talendale retreated into his own room, and the door was Firmly and irrevocably shut. Vaniel, the trainee said softly, his eyes dark with compassion and understanding. Is something wrong? I, Vaniel began, then closed his eyes as a fit of trembling sit him, hit him. I, the music, I, suddenly, Talendal was beside him, holding him, quieting his shivering. It's all right, he murmured into Vaniel's ear, his breath warm and like a caress in his hair. It's all right, I understand. Vaniel stood as an unmoving, dead stick, hardly daring to breathe, afraid to open his eyes. Talendale stroked his hair, the back of his neck, his hands warm and light, and Vaniel thought his heart was going to pound itself to pieces. I understand. He repeated, I know what it's like to want something, and know you'll never have it. You do? Daniel faltered. Talendale chuckled. It was a warm, rich sound, and his fingers traced the line of Daniel's spine, slowly, sensuously. Daniel started to relax in Talendale's arms, and his eyes popped open in startlement when his own hands at Talendale's chest encountered not cloth, but skin. The trainee was starkly, gloriously nude. Then again, Talendale whispered, 
looking deeply into Vaniel's eyes. Maybe I will get it. Violent Vaniel made a strangling noise, wrenched himself away and fled into the darkness, into cold, into the middle of his old dream. First there had been the snow plain. Then, as he walked across it, the teeth of ice had begun poking their way up through their granules, glen, granular snow. They had grown higher as he walked, but what he hadn't known was that they were growing behind him as well. Now he was trapped inside a ring of them, trapped inside walls of ice, smoother than the smoothest glass, colder than the coldest winter. He couldn't break out. He pounded on them until his arms were leaden, to no effect. Everywhere he looked, Ice, snow, nothing alive, nothing but white and pale blue and silver. Even the sky was white, and he was so alone, so terribly alone. Nothing soft, nothing comforting, nothing welcoming. Only the ice, only the unyielding, unmoving ice, and the white, grainy snow. He was cold. So appallingly cold, so frozen that he ached all over, he had to get out. Hoping to climb over the barrier, he reached for the top of one of the ice walls and pulled back as his hands he pulled back his hands as pain stabbed through them. He stared at them stupidly, his palms were slashed nearly to the bone, and blood oozed sluggishly from the cuts to pool at his feet. There was blood on the snow, red blood, but as he stared at it in numb fascination, it turned blue. Then his hands began to burn with the cold yet fiery pain of the wounds. He gasped, tears blurring his vision. He wanted to scream, but could only moan. Gods, it hurt. He'd give anything to make it stop hurting. Suddenly, the pain did stop. His hands went numb. His eyes cleared and he looked down at his injured hands again and saw to his horror that the slashes had frozen over and his hands were turning to ice blue and shiny and utterly without feeling even as he gazed at them the ice crept further up over his wrists crawling up his forearms and he cried out then he wasn't there anymore he was somewhere else it was dark but he could see by the lightning by a strange blue glow about him, lightning flickered overhead and seemed to be controlled by what he did or thought. He was standing on a mound of snow in the center of a very narrow valley. To either side of him were walls of ice that towered over his head, reaching to the night sky in sheer crystalline perfection. Behind him, there was nothing. Somehow he knew this, but before him, Vaniel! Before him, an army. An army of mindless monsters, creatures with only one goal, to get past him. Already he was wounded. He twisted to direct the lightning to lash into their ranks, and felt pain lancing down his right side, felt the hot blood trickling down his leg into his boot and freezing there. There were too many of them. He was doomed. He gasped and wept at the horrible pain in his side, and he knew that he was dying, dying alone. So appallingly alone. Vaniel! He struggled up and out of the canyon of ice, out of the depth of sleep, shaken by the nightmare, by hot, almost scorching hands on his shoulders, and a commanding voice in his ears. He blinked, feeling things and not connecting them. His eyes hurt. He'd been crying. His hair, his pillow, were soggy with tears. He was still so cold. Too cold even to shiver. That was why Talendel's hands on his bare shoulders felt so hot. Vaniel. Talendel's eyes were soft sable in the light of the tiny bedside candle, like dark windows on the night, windows that somehow reflected concern. His hands felt like branding irons on Vaniel's skin. Gods, Vaniel, you're like ice! As he tried to sit up, Vaniel realized he was still leaking tears. As soon as he started moving, he began shivering so hard he couldn't speak. I... I he said and couldn't get and could get nothing more out. Talendel snagged his robe from the foot of the bed without even looking around and wrapped it about his naked shoulders. It wasn't enough. 
Vaniel shook with tremors he could not stop, and the robe wasn't doing anything to warm him. Vaniel. Talendel began, then simply rammed his arm wrapped his arms around Vaniel and held him. Vaniel resisted, tried to pull away. He blinked. The snow plane stretched all around him, empty, but not asking anything of him. Cold, but not a threat. But lonely, lonely, oh gods, how empty. But not asking, not hurting. He blinked again, and Talendel was still there, still staring into his eyes with an openness and a concern he could not doubt. Go away, he gasped, waiting for pain, waiting to be laughed at. Why? Talendel asked quietly. I want to help you. He was turning to ice. Soon there would be no feeling and nothing to feel, and he would be trapped. Talendel took advantage of his distraction to get his arms around him. Van, I wouldn't hurt you. I couldn't hurt you. He closed his eyes and gasped for, for breath, his chest tight and hurting. Oh, God, I want this. I'm just trying to get you warm again, Tylendale said with a hint of impatience. That's all. Relax, will you? He did relax. He couldn't maintain his indifference, and to his shame, began crying again. And he couldn't stop the tears any more than he could the shivering. But not only did Talendale not seem to mind. Come on, Vaniel. He soothed, pulling him into a comfortable sit position on his shoulder, supporting him like a little child. It's all right. I told you I won't hurt you. I wouldn't ever hurt you. Cry yourself out. It's just you and me. I'll never tell anyone. On my honor, absolutely on my honor. It was already too late to save his battered dignity anyway. Daniel surrendered appearance, self-respect, everything. He sagged against Talendale's shoulder, burying his face in Talendale's soft, worn blue robe. He let the last of his pride dissolve, releasing all the tears he'd been keeping behind his walls of indifference and arrogance. Soon, he was crying so hard he couldn't even think, just cling to Talendale's shoulders and sob. He didn't really hear what Talendale was saying. Only the tone of his voice registered in his sleep-mazed grief. Comforting, compassionate, caring. He cried his eyes sore and dry. He cried until his nose felt swollen to the size of an apple. All the time he shivered with the terrible cold that seemed to have become one with his very bones. Shivered until the bed shook. Finally, there just wasn't any tears left. And he wasn't shivering anymore. He was warm. More than warm. Protected. And completely exhausted. Talendale held him as carefully as if he was made of spun glass and would shatter at a breath. Just held him. That was all. It was enough. It was more than he ever remembered having. He wished it could last forever. May the gods help me. I've always wanted this. Done? Talendale asked very quietly, a good while after the last of the sobs and tremors had finished shaking his body. He nodded, reluctantly and felt the arms holding him relax. He sat up again, and Talendale cupped both his hands around his face, turning him into the light. He winced away from it, knowing what he must look like. The trainee chuckled, but it had a kindly, not a mocking sound. You're a mess, Peacock, he said, somehow making the words a joke to be shared between them. Daniel smiled tentatively, and Talendale dabbed at his eyes with the corner of the sheet. Do you have so common a thing as a handkerchief around here? He asked quite casually. Daniel nodded and fumbled at the drawer of the bedside table until Talendale patted his hand away and got the square of linen out of it himself. Here. He gave it to Daniel, then settled back a little. I couldn't sleep. I got up to get some wine and heard you. Do this often? Daniel blew his nose and looked up at the older boy through half-swollen eyes. Often enough, he confessed, nightmare. He nodded and looked down at his hands. No, why? No. He whispered, but he did. He did. It was hearing the bards, hearing that he'd never, ever have, and then 
encountering Talendel and knowing... God. Want to tell me about it? He dared another gla glance at the trainee. The quiet face of the older boy was not easy to read. But there were no signs of deception there that Vaniel could see. But... You'll laugh at me, he said, ready to pull away again. No, on my honor, then I don't lie. I won't laugh at you, and nothing you tell me will go outside this room unless you want it to. Daniel shivered again, and without any warning at all, the words came spelling out. It's ice, he said stiffling, studying his hands and the handkerchief he had twisted up in them. It's all around me. I'm trapped. I can't get out. I'm so cold, so cold. Then I cut myself, and I start to turn into ice. Then sometimes, like tonight, I'm somewhere else. I'm fighting these things, and I know I'm going to die, and the worst of it isn't the pain or the dying. It's it's that... that... Uh, he faltered. I, I'm all alone. So totally alone. It sounded so banal. So incredibly foolish, just put into words like that, especially when he didn't, couldn't, tell Tylendel the rest, the part about him. He looked up, expecting to see mockery on the older boy's face, and froze, seeing nothing of the kind. Van, I think I know what you mean, Tylendel said slowly. There are times when, when being alone is a hurt, it hurts worse than dying. When it's easier to die than be alone, aren't there? Daniel blinked, caught without words. Talendel's voice was so soft, he might well have been speaking to himself. Sometimes, maybe it's better to have had someone and lost them than to never have had anyone. Then Talendel's eyes focused for a moment on Daniel and Vanel's heart spasmed with the flash of emotion he saw, a longing he'd never, ever dreamed to see there, directed at him. Oh, God, I never, I thought, he can't. He does. He is. Father will, I don't care. He snatched at what was proffered before it could be taken away. Oh, God, I never, I thought. He can't. He does. He is. Father will. I don't care. He snatched at what was preferred before it could be taken away. Vaniel. The blonde began. Wendell. Vaniel interrupted, urgently, during the nickname he'd heard his aunt use. Stay with me. Please. Please. His words tumbled over one another as he hurried to get them out before Talendel could interrupt. He caught hold of the other boy's wrist. The ice is still there. I know it is. It's inside me and it's freezing me from the inside out. It's killing my feelings. I think it's killing me. Please. Please. Don't leave me alone with it. You don't know what you're asking, Talendel said almost angrily. Pulling his hand out of Vaniel's, his eyes no longer readable. You can't know. You don't know what I am. But I do, Vaniel protested desperately. I do. The girls tell me things to get my attention. They told me you're a uh, Shayachern. They said that you don't sleep with girls, that you... He felt himself blush. The rush of blood almost painful. His cheeks were so sore from crying. Then damn it, Vaniel. What do you think I'm made of? Talendel cried harshly. His face twisted and his eyes reflecting internal pain. What do you think I am? Marble? You're beautiful. You're bright. You're everything I'd ever ask for. You think I can stay here and not want you? Good gods! I won't take an advantage of an innocent, but... What you're asking of me would try the control of a saint. You don't understand. I know what I'm asking. Van replied, catching his wrist again before he could get up and stalk off into the dark. I do know. Talendel shook his head violently and looked away. Lendl, 
Look at me, Daniel pleaded, pouring his heart out in a confession he'd never have dared to make before this. Listen, I don't like girls either. I'm not an innocent. I know what I want. Lendl, please listen. I've been... I've bedded enough of them to know that they don't do anything for me. It's about as mechanical as dancing or eating. They just don't mean anything to me. Talendel stopped trying to pull away and turned a face to Vandal that was so full of dumbfounded surprise that the younger boy had to fight hysterical laughter. And I, I do? You, Talendel began, but then his face hardened. Don't play with me, Daniel. Don't toy with me. I've had that game played on me once already. And I don't want to hear you crying to Seville in the morning that I seduced you. Daniel bit his lip and looked directly into Talendel's eyes, pleadingly. I'm not playing, Lendl. Please. He felt his eyes sting, and this time didn't try to hide the two tears that spilled down his cheeks. I, I've been thinking about this for a long while, almost since I got here, and they told me about you, and you never laughed at me. You were kind to me. You kept being kind to me, even when I was pretty rude. It meant a lot to me, and I didn't know how to thank you. I started feeling things around you. I was scared. I didn't dare let you guess. I didn't want to admit what I wanted. Now I do. The older boy looked at him sideways. Which is? Daniel gulped. I want to be with you, Lendl. And if you go, I won't have any choice but the ice. Once Taladel kept his face between his strong hands and gently brushed the tears away with hesitant fingers. He stared deeply into Vaniel's eyes for so long and so searchingly that Vaniel thought he surely must be reading down, right down to the depths of his soul. Vaniel held his gaze and tried to make his own eyes say that he meant every word he'd said. Tylendale finally nodded, once, slowly. Then he reached out, quite deliberately, and snuffed the candle before taking Vaniel back into his arms. It was very dark. No light outside, no sound but the rain falling. After a moment, Talendel chuckled with what sounded like surprise and very softly into Vaniel's ear. I'm beginning to wonder just who's taking advantage of who here. Then, a bit later, another chuckled to tell Vaniel that he was teasing. Move over, you selfish little peacock. I'm about to freeze to my death. Then, no words at all. Then again, they didn't need words. The halls were totally deserted, chill, and lit by lamps that were slowly flickering out as they used up the last of the night's oil. Seville's slow, weary footsteps echoed before and behind her without disturbing so much as a spider. At one point on the long walk back to her quarters from the council chamber, Seville wasn't entirely certain she was going to make it. She was so damn tired, she was about ready to give up and lie down in the middle of the cold hall. I'm getting too old for this, she told herself. No more younglings after this lot. I can't take the emotional ups and downs. And I truly cannot take all these all-night sessions with a lot of stubborn old goats. She grinned a little ironically at herself, of which I am one of the most stubborn, but gods, hours like this are for the young. I hurt, and I think I'm going to beg off Lendl's weather-working lesson today, else my bones are going to ache more. God bless the door at last. She pushed open the door to the suite. Talendel had left a night candle burning, but it, too, was guttering. No matter, there was the pearly gray light of an overcast dawn in creeping in through the windows of her room. The life bondeds and Talendel's. She froze. Talendel's bed was unoccupied. She could see it through the door. Don't panic, old woman. She cautioned herself. Just do a bit of a trance. First, you shared magic. You've got the line to his mind. See where it leads. She found the little energy link that said Tylendel 
and followed it back to where Tylendale himself was. It wasn't very far. Still in the suite, in fact. In Vaniel's room. Vaniel's room? Her first reaction was to fling the door open and demand to know what was going on. Her second was to chuckle. With aura overtones like that, she bloody well knew what was going on. But, Vaniel! Gods have mercy. No sign he was Shea Churn. Then again, given Withen's prejudices, he might have been feared for a long time that the boy was Fay, And Withen's answer to that fear would have been exactly what he'd been doing. Keeping the boy sheltered at home rather than fostering him out and trying to shove him into the direction Withen wanted. Trying to force the boy into a mold he was totally unsuited for. He might also well have protected the boy from even the idea that same-sex pairings were possible. So the boy himself wouldn't have known what he was until he first found out about Lendl. Which answered a great many questions indeed. The question now was, what had led to this? And what was it going to mean for the future? She took a deep breath of the chilly, damp air and groped her way down back to her own room. No use rushing things. Questioning could be done just as easy with herself lying in her own warm bed. Easier. Actually, given how she felt, she stripped down to the skin, promised her weary bones a bath later, and dragged on a bedgown before crawling into the blankets. The warm blankets. And she blessed Talendel's thoughtfulness for putting on the warming spell on her bed before he'd take it to his own, or whatever. She settled herself in completely and reached out a thin tendril of mind speech in private mode. If the imp was awake, he was. Mm. Civil? Came a sleep flared thought, dense with a feeling of contentment. Thought I heard you come in. Found me, hmm? Aye. And I have a pile of questions. She shifted herself until her left shoulder stopped aching quite so much. The only important one is, how did you talk him into it? I didn't. It was all Van's idea. She almost lost the mind speech thread with her own start of surprise and had to grope after it. Sounds like I really missed something. What in the name of the Havens happened last night? Too much to talk about now. There were overtones of mental and physical weariness to his mind voice. But he's going to be alright, Seville. We did more than just the physical. I think he must have talked for hours. Before and after. He handed me the key to himself. And he wanted me to have it. She raised a sardonic mental eyebrow. Lendl, I don't want to drench you with cold water. But I may remind you of what happened last time morning arrived with you in someone else's bed. It's all right, Seville. It really is this time. A feeling of faint surprise. You know, you're always teasing me about falling in love, but I don't know. This feels different. Seville snorted. Right. It always does. No, don't let an old cynic disturb you. Teacher, I think this is going to be something more than just a one time. I think you needs me. Oh, heavens. All right, if that's the way you think it's going, just let me know in the morning if you plan to move in with him or him with you. Though his is the better chamber. We could use a spare for guests flavor of laughter like crisp apples. You just want my room bag. If you aren't using it, seriously, Lendl, this is important. I want to have a long talk with him when I get up, and I want you there. He really should know what he's letting himself in for as a share churn. I don't think we should let that get out, and I'll mind speak with you once on that before we get, before we talk with him. Hmm. Cancel your classes this morning. I'm too tired. And I have the feeling you aren't you weren't exactly early to sleep. Another apple feeling of laughter, and the mind link faded, and she let exhaustion pull her down into a slumber that she really didn't want. Not anymore. One last thought before sleep came. Great good gods. What am I going to tell Withen? Towndale raised himself up on his elbow and looked down at the slumbering boy beside him, 
Rest had repaired the damages that several hours of soul-wrenching weeping had done to Vaniel's face. Relaxed and with all his barriers down, he looked as innocent as an unawakened child, which he was, as Talendel now knew quite intimately, not. Not in any way except, perhaps, his vulnerability. Then, he whispered, touching his shoulder and feeling just a faint chill of apprehension despite his words to his mentor. Can you wake up a little? Daniel stirred, wrinkled his nose, and half opened his eyes, and when he saw who was beside him, he smiled, with a heart-stopping sweetness. With all his masks gone, he was as charming as he was beautiful. Hmm? He said, blinking as Talendale felt a surge of relief and gratitude that this was not going to be a repeat of the infamous Nevis affair. Want a roommate? You? Why? He grinned. He knew now that you had to show Van that something was a joke, or often he'd take it seriously. Seville wants to seem to want my room back. For guests, she says. Besides, I like your company. Van's reply, though not verbal, was a definite and unmistakable affirmative. We have, Seville said dryly, several problems here. She had that mind speech conference with Talendel as she'd gotten herself put together for the day. Nice thing, mind speech. Let you cover them more, more than one thing at once. And after giving it thorough consideration while she bathed, she decided to have her little talk with Vaniel in his room. With any luck, he'd feel less threatened there. She did usurp the most comfortable chair in the room, though. The privilege of age, she told herself, waiting for the two young men to settle themselves without seeming to consult about it. Talendale sat on the edge of the bed, and Vanuel arranged himself cross-legged on the floor at his feet. Ah, uh, the flexibility of youth. <sighs> With that, I could still do that. The body language gave her spirits a lift, though. The way that Vanuel had positioned himself was interesting. At Talendale's feet, below both her head and his lover's, that could well show he'd given up that pose of arrogant superiority. Very interesting. I wonder if having a steady lover at his side might well give Lendl something to think about besides his twin and that damned feud. On the other hand, this lad's been so affection-starved, this could be another sort of trouble. Yes, indeed. We have quite a few little problems here, she repeated. Talendale nodded at her words. Vaniel looked puzzled, at first, then thoughtful. The first problem, and the one that's going to tie into all the others, Vaniel, is your father. She paused, and Vaniel bit his lip. I'm sure that you realize that if he finds out about this, he's going to react badly. Vaniel coughed and bowed his head, hiding his face for a moment. When he looked back up, he was wearing a weary, ironic half-smile. A smile that had as much pain in it as humor. It was, by far and away the most open expression Seville had ever seen him wear. Badly is something of an understatement, aunt, he replied, rubbing his temple with one finger. He'll... God, I can't predict what he'll do, but he'll be in a rage, that's for certain. He'll pull you home, Van, Talendel said in a completely flat voice, and he can do it. You're not of age. You aren't chosen. And you aren't in Bardic. And I can't protect you, Seville sighed, wishing that she could. I can stall him off for a while, seeing as he officially turned guardianship of you over to me. But it won't last more than a couple months. Then, well, I'll give you my educated guess as to what Within will do. I think he'll put you under house arrest long enough for everybody to forget about you, then find himself a compliant priest and ship you off to a temple. Probably one far away, with very strict rules about outside contact. There are, I'm sorry to say, several sects who hold that Shea Churn are tainted. They'd be only happy to pur purify you for Within, and Within's gold. And under the laws of this kingdom, none of us could save you from them. Daniel nodded. By the startled agreement in his eyes, Seville reckoned that this was a spe speculation he'd entertained before this, all though for different causes. 
So is there anything I can do? He asked quietly. Obviously, she said, or I wouldn't be talking to you now. But you aren't going to like this solution to your problems. It's pretty heartbreakingly simple. Outside of this room, Vaniel, nothing is to change. But he twisted his head around to see what Tylendel thought about this, only to find that his lover was nodding, in complete agreement with her. Seville's right, man, Tylendel said sadly. But, Seville, Vaniel protested, holding out one hand toward him in entreaty, then turning the same pleading eyes on Seville, when Tallandale shook his head. Marduk and Donnie are discreet, and I trust Margaret to keep what she knows behind her teeth, even under torture. But if you want to stay here, Van, you wouldn't say or do anything to portray your relationship to Lendl. The moment people start to talk, it'll get back to your father. The quickest way to make them talk, love, Tallandale said in what was almost a whisper is to change, is to be even friendlier to me than you've been. You told me the girls told you I was a pervert. Vaniel's eyes widened at Tallandale's directness. It can't have escaped your notice how they sniggered and giggled about it. And they were being polite. My preferences are not generally sociable. There are only two reasons why I have as little trouble as I do. The first is that I'm a herald trainee, and heralds are allowed a bit more license than ordinary mortals. And my patron is Seville. She just happens to outrank everybody in the circle except the Queen's own. And the other reason? Daniel said in a very subdued voice. What stretched Tondell's mouth was something less than a smile. <laughs> the fact that I took a couple of the worst offenders on and kept knocking them down until they didn't get up. Oh. Talendale caught up one of his hands in both of his own. I know that you want everyone to know about us. I can't tell you how much that means to me. But it will mean a lot more to me to show... to know you are going to be able to stay with me. And to do that, young Vaniel, Seville said, intruding into the same interaction between them, you are going to have to begin a performance a master player couldn't equal. Lendl and I have been talking about you this afternoon. From the complete astonishment on his face, Seville could tell that he hadn't guessed that they'd been in conference via mind speech. For that matter, it might be that he didn't know they both had that gift. We share a mind speech gift, lad, and it's damned imp useful at times like this. He's told me some of what you had told him, and it rather changed my mind about you. But I will not lie to you. I'm going to help you because he wants it. Because he wants you here. So now I'm going to order you. Outside this suite, you are to be the same arrogant little bastard that arrived here. And if you can manage to be slightly rude to Lendl, that's even better. And in return... I'll make this suite a little sanctuary for the both of you. Is it a bargain? Vaniel, who had gone rather pale, gulped and nodded. Seville smiled for the first time since she'd begun this conference. That's a good lad. If you're half of what Vaniel claims for you, I'm going to come to like you a great deal. And I'm sorry for the treatment that you've had from your father. I'll tell you that he isn't the same person I knew when I was chosen. He's gone stiff and stubborn, and altogether hidebound. Maybe it's age. Maybe it's that a lot of his old friends have taken a long walk, and he's seeing death looking for him, too. Maybe it's that priest he's gotten tied up with. I just don't know. She coughed. Well, that's not to the point. What is to the point is that you'll only have to keep this charade up until you're eighteen. You'll be your own man, then, and can do what you please. And I'll see to it that Lendl begins having trouble with his mage lessons. She winked and Tylendale chortled. I think that we can keep him out of whites until you're of age. After that, if this love affair lasts that long, you'll have to make your own decision on, the, on your own. Fair enough. More than fair, Aunt Seville. 
Vanya looked very subdued, and quite unlike the boy that had faced her something like a month ago. She couldn't quite pinpoint why. Lendl, what is it about him? She mind spoke, letting her puzzlement drift over. No mask, came the immediate answer. This is the real Vanya. Dear heart, nobody but me and maybe his sister is seen. Now see why I love him? The last thought stopped her cold. Are you that sure, Kichara? Are you really that sure? His eyes caught hers over Vanyal's head, caught and held them. I'm that sure. And him? I don't know. But he was willing to defy his father for me. And I think that says something. She closed her own eyes against that burning, intense gaze. And may the gods help and guard you. She turned her attention back to Vanyal and quickly. He was still looking toward Tylendel, and the very same look was in his eyes. And a vulnerability and apprehension that cut her to the heart. I'll help you out all I can, son, she said quietly. I'll help you all I can. Hey guys, so that was chapter 5 of Mercedes Lackey's Magic's Pawn. Woo! Recorded in two parts. And, or, two different days of recording. That are, I'm, I'm still sorry that that happened. I, 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 I'm very sorry. So, a little bit of news. Um, I should be starting here soon a collab with Dustin Wears Pants. Dustin Wears Pants. Is like apostrophe in there to show possessiveness. Um, his second channel, one of his other channels, second channel? I believe second channel. Telling stories. That channel is all about reading children's books. Now, I want to say I was the one that inspired him to do that because I'm so awesome, but uh, he probably got the idea from somewhere else. I'm just being a little peacock here saying that he got the idea from me to read children's books. He, he reads children's books. Uh, I've seen him do all the places you'll go. Um, I thought I saw him do a Dr. Seuss book. Um, little Blue Truck. Whole bunch of little kids' books. Now, hopefully I'll be starting a little collab, maybe a series collaboration with Dustin, doing children's fairy tales. That's personally what I want to do. I need to reconvene with Dustin and decide what's going to be going on. Um, I do have some children's books here around my house. Not sure how many I have. Uh, we went through and gave a whole bunch of them to a thrift store a while back because we don't have any small children in this house. The youngest is my little brother, who is 14. I think we gave away most of our books to um, friends of my dad's who have small children. Um, I don't have kids. I don't want kids for a while. <laughs> no. But children's books, children's stories, fables, not the Brothers Grimm fables. Much as I would actually like to start reading Brothers Grimm fables for you guys. Um, that might be another thing I do. What would this be? Four books? Three books I have started and then a children's series done with Dustin? Wow. I feel like I'm a little in over my head, but no, I'm not. Nah, I'm good. <laughs> so, yeah, this has been Mercedes Lackey Mad Mercedes Lackey's Magic's Pawn, Chapter 5. Still feel bad about getting out so late. Look forward in the future to a children's story, whether it's going to be a fairy tale or children's books. I don't know, but look forward to that coming in the future, the collaboration with Telling Stories.
the second channel of Dustin Wears Pants. So, this is Kat, signing off. Bye!